conversations with uh, colleagues in education and philosophy from around the world. Um, my name is Richard Mortmore House, and I guess I'm the host. Uh, my guest today is Rick Kite. Uh, Rick is a, uh, if I look at this, uh, the director of the D.B. Reinhardt Institute for Ethics and Leadership, an endowed professor in ethics at Viterbo University, where he teaches a variety of courses on ethical issues in business, health care, law, politics, and the environment. He has published and lectured widely on justice, forgiveness, uh, virtue, and the meaning of life. He grew up in Farzi, is that the way it's? Crazy. Crazy. Okay. Yeah, crazy. rhymes with crazy. Okay. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, small town in northwest Minnesota uh, and went to Hamlin University where he received a BA in philosophy. And then he went on to graduate school and obtained a PhD in philosophy from John Hopkins University in 1994. He's also taught at Pikes Peak uh, uh, Community College in Colorado Springs. Uh, Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Christian Brothers University in Memphis, and he is the author of several books um, and is a regular contributor to the La Crosse Tribune's Ethical Life. With that, welcome to the uh, conversation, uh, Rick. Yeah, good to talk to you, Mark. Oh, good. Um, so uh, as we talked about before, I want you to tell us a little bit about the uh, Reinhardt uh, Ethics Institute, because I think it's a kind of a unique uh, institute, uh, at least in most, uh, rare in most universities. So tell us a little bit about what it does and what your role is. You know, the Reinhardt Institute started 23 years ago um, as a way to uh, focus the attention of the campus and the community on ethics. And so what we do is we we host programs, a number, an annual ethics conference, uh, certain seminars, workshops, and so forth on uh, either either explicitly on leadership or especially on ethics related to leadership. And then we also host a number of speakers. So we have an annual lecture series and we do a couple of them. One, one lecture series is kind of our evening, uh, oftentimes big name speakers that are that are flying in from around the country to speak on particular topics. And then we also do a smaller series that we call Leadership at Noon, where we have local business leaders that kind of talk about the story of their company and how they've, how they've, the leadership lessons they've learned along the way. And is there, I, I guess, you know, it, it's uh, easy to be sort of cynical because one thinks of business as uh, one directed, and that's largely towards profit. Uh, and how does the uh, ethical element and the leadership uh, fit together in, in, in these programs? Well, it's really interesting because, I mean, you, uh, there are all kinds of businesses. Uh, man, there are many organizations that are are officially classified as nonprofit, but they're still in the business. They have to pay their employees and and they have to provide revenue, you know, to support their mission. Um, and that's often what many, especially smaller, not smaller for-profit businesses do. They've got some kind of mission to provide some good or service that's needed for the community. That I mean, that's why they're in business in the first place. And then they also are providing support for, for families through their community. And mm -hmm. then often providing other kinds of support in community. So we have what I find so interesting about that series is we learn like what what organizations that are are kind of historically we think of well their business so they're just they're just trying to make a profit. Well, their their focus is not usually on the profit so much as what kind of needed good or service are they providing for the community. How do they do that in some responsible way that builds up the community rather than than taking they don't want to be parasitic upon it mm -hmm. and how do they do it in a way that provides a really good life for their employees and so um, we look for companies that have that kind of focus and then have them talk about both their like the responsibility they have for developing an internal culture and then for having positive effects on the community in which they reside yeah okay well and uh, you know interestingly enough that 
uh, applies to uh, institutions of higher learning as well, I would suspect. And, and like I, I think we you know, talked real briefly about, it's one of the things I want to explore with you, and that's the whole idea of the ethics of teaching. Is there a special ethics of teaching that is kind of unique to, uh, let's just say, college instruction uh, that uh, really needs to be emphasized and and uh, and brought forward? Well, yeah, so teaching ethics is very different than the ethics of teaching, right? Yeah. So, And I think of the ethics of teaching as, like, what are the practices we have within the profession that allow us to in, engage in this profession virtuously? And and one of the key things is is how do we focus on it in such a way that we're we're helping our young people who are in our classes um, flourish, and then also become citizens who are able to to contribute in some kind of positive and meaningful way into whatever community they end up residing. And and I find it really frustrating that. Um, so right, so right now, I think so many, um, especially institutions of higher learning, so many colleges and universities um, are not focusing seriously on that, and, uh, on the ethics of teaching. The courses in ethics, right, where they think I, I'm, I'm teaching ethics to these students as a part of their education, but they're not thinking seriously about what are the ethical responsibilities of faculty, um, and um, and. This is especially important now in, in a time when um, so many students are in, in acquiring a really burdensome debt oh, yes. in order to go to college, go to university. And it's a bargain they're making, you know, that this is going to pay off in some way. Um, and, you know, it sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and those economics are changing. I, I wish we had more of a discussion. By the way, I can give you an example of this where I think like it becomes really problematic. So I, I get a um, a book. You know, as a as faculty members, you get books all the time from publishers asking you to like if you will review them mm -hmm. um, and serve as serve as a reviewer. And then and so I I get this book. It's a business ethics text asking me if I'll be a reviewer, but one of the things they require in the review process is that I use it in my classes. <laughs> well, that would require my students to buy the book. Yes, yes. So then I can get my name on the book as a reviewer, right? Which, which is a classic conflict of interest, which the book actually had a chapter about, but I don't think it wanted you to say, like even purchasing the book and agreeing to review it is a conflict of interest. That wasn't listed as one of the yes. examples. But and, there's and, all and, kinds of examples like that that we get in, but I'm not sure we're very self-reflective about it. And I think that's um, my own experience is, is that's quite new. I mean, I remember um, doing that and and I don't ever remember an expectation uh, from the publisher that uh, that the deal was that, the, that I would buy the book for the course. Uh, but that's, yeah. you know, well, it's a scam. Right. It's a <laughs> it's a scam. <laughs> right. Well, you know, when you think about this, the whole conflict between uh, making money and 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 uh, w what college is about. I still remember, uh, gosh, it's probably 20 years ago now at, or close uh, when we used to do when I used to be involved in the student recruitment stuff and we would do stuff for parents and whatnot. And I remember talking to one of the uh, guys who came uh, and with with his, his child, um, and uh, we were talking about well, what was his major in college? And he said, well, he said that was a philosophy major. And I said, well, what do you do? He said, I'm a house painter. And I said, how does that fit into being a, a, a background in philosophy? And he said. I couldn't live without my philosophy background, he said. I paint houses to make money, but um, what what philosophy does is basically taught me how to live. And I thought to hear that from a parent was really quite uh, unusual. And I think that's kind of a part of what the dilemma of teaching college is. Is, is this about helping students to make money or does it help them to, to live a better life? 
And I, you know, that's, that's the attitude with which I went into college. Um, my dad was a house painter and so was my grandfather. And so I grew up working with my dad painting houses and <coughs> my, my thought was, well, I don't know if I can get a job in philosophy, but it's what I really want to study. And then I may end up painting houses again, but I'm going to, I want to, <clears throat> I want to understand more about how to live. And, um, and I think at one point, many universities took that very seriously, especially, you know, like places where I'm at Viterbo, where we're historically thought of as a liberal arts university. The problem is those, those programs are shrinking so much because we can't get students to major in them. And that's a problem across the United States, right? It's not, not just us, it's everywhere. Um, but I, I think part of the problem with the, the reason it's hard for students to go in with that kind of attitude to a university now because they have become so much more expensive. So there's yes. relative to the cost, there's much less aid, aid available. Um, and so you can't really afford to say, well, I'm going to get the education and then go and make a living doing something unrelated yeah. because most of the highest earning jobs have to be related. They require a degree of some sort, right? Yes, yes. And I, I blame our institutions to a great extent for that. We have so many more administrators than we did 40 years ago when I was in college, um, and we have so many more student services. It used to be primarily faculty, right? That was were the main employees, and um, and the faculty didn't have. I mean, there wasn't much else. You 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 went to class. I mean, there would be a gym and there would be a few student activities, cafeteria that served bad food. Yes. Um, yes. But you, the whole point of it was going to class. That was the point of the university and and learning um, within the classroom. And I find that that's that's a portion of the university experience now and a portion of the um, expectations. Yeah, well, you know, when I started, college was actually, you know, even before you did. Uh, but when I started at UWL, um, I could live at home and pay for my tuition by working at McDonald's. Yeah. I, I paid $118 a semester for a full load of courses. Now, I know it's a lot more money now, but still, it, that was that was McDonald's money at a dollar an hour for 20 hours a week, and I could afford to do that. And that's not and even- you could have, you could have you could afford to study what you loved. I did, right? yes. Yeah. The idea of being an amateur scholar was was viable. Um, I'm not sure it's viable anymore unless you have family money that's that's going to provide for your education or a full ride scholarship, something like that. Well, in, in my most productive semester in terms of learning uh, when, was when another thing happened that is now impossible in that I was a non-student for a semester which means I just hung out on campus. I went to lectures that I wanted to go to and I met with friends and I suppose this is a heresy too, but we drank beer, read novels and philosophy. And that was a semester's work. And that was probably the most influential part of my education uh, because it that's where I actually learned how to think that I learned the beginnings of what it meant to have a mind um, and I think those opportunities are so rare these days. Well, it's, you know, the ability to explore books for oneself. I find that like, that's really crucial. And, you know, and I'll, you know, occasionally I have, have students that are doing that. It's, it's such a, such a gift to have students that, that want to do that and then want to talk about these new ideas that they're discovering um but this is an important thing that um I, I see relatively little of of course there weren't that many other students oh. that were interested in doing that when i was in college either so that's okay. i'm not sure that that's changed too much no I, I i think you're right about that that's you know there was a group of us that did that and we were the 
oddballs even back then. Um, right. So, but um, I, I I wonder about another thing closely related to this, and and it's about and this is a, for me a very complex piece, and that is how much do we instill self learning, and how much do we spend and and this is really difficult. How much do we provide students with steps to do to learn better? And and it's funny because I advocate doing that with students, you know, giving the scaffolding to make the next step. And yet at the same time, I sometimes think, you know, I, I figured things out for myself. Well, yeah, I made a lot of mistakes in terms of doing that, but there was oh. a certain joy in realizing, oh my goodness, I figured this out and it wasn't something that an instructor told me. And that's a conflict even in the way I teach, how much to be helpful and how much to let students struggle. Does that, does that make sense in terms of that conflict? Yeah, I and I go back and forth on it in different classes. But I, I mean, I think the longer I've been teaching, the more I... Like what I what I want to do is try to engage the students in a conversation, letting letting them know that this is a historical conversation. This goes back a long ways, like the most significant ideas. So mostly when I'm teaching ethics, um, we're talking about ideas that have a long history of over two thousand years, um, and that they're participants in it. Yes, yes. And so right. And so if they can they can start to to get a familiarity with some of the vocabulary, a little bit of the history, then that's that I think that's that scaffolding you're talking about. That's where they can they can step upon these ideas to 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 move about using that in their own life to to make some progress in in the way that they're thinking about what's right and what's wrong, and and like what's a worthwhile life to live. Um, yeah. Well, let me just I want to yeah. grab something off the shelf here. Um, <clears throat> this is a this is a book that. Uh, Carol Gilligan uh, co-edited a while back. And of course, as you will know, since you were involved in getting it, um, the uh, Carol Gilligan was one of our, uh, one of your guests here for, uh, for part of the lecture series, the ethical le lecture series. But uh, anyway, there's this, oh, here it is. This, you'll have, this is about, this is about girls, but I think it applies very widely. She, she writes, Adolescent, uh, perhaps adolescent is especially critical time in women's development because it poses a problem of connection that is not easily resolved. And this is the poetic line that I like so much. As the river of a girl's life flows into the sea of Western culture, she is in danger of drowning or disappearing. To take on the problem of appearance, which is a problem of her development, is to connect her life history with history on a cultural scale. She must enter and by enter disrupt the tradition in which humans, for the most part male, have a struggle. This struggle breaks out in a girl's life at the edge of adolescence. And the fate of the struggle is key to girls' development and to Western civilization. Well, I think that's the, the idea about being a, a part of our culture is, I think, what you're sort of getting at with that idea of philosophy being 2,000 plus years old and that they have to somehow be a part of that conversation. And, and my sense is that this isn't something that happens just with girls. It happens with a lot of kids. They don't know. They don't have a sense that they have the potential of being contributors and participants in the culture that they grow up in. Uh, and and I, I sometimes think that's our job is to help them get a sense of that culture that they are living and making. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, and I, you know, I think for a while we were making real progress in kind of opening up the accessibility of all kinds of cultural ideas to anybody. So like Carol Gilligan was really significant in, in, in opening up the doors to women, especially for, for girls and young women to enter into that conversation with a sense of legitimacy and, and, and having a more authoritative voice. Also recognizing that there might be some things that connected to gender that shape the inflections of that voice in certain ways. But but like she did a lot in that area. Oh yes, yes. What what I see us doing now in many ways is is closing the doors again and saying, like, you have to stay in your lane. Yes, yes. Right? And um and well, this is one of the conflicts between I think like second and third wave feminism and kind of the newer forms of of it, it you know it's so much of the thinking now is much more rights based, um, and it's so proprietary that there's a there's I I really hear that like the tone is different within the classroom like a need to be respectful of everybody but a a reluctance. To just open it up and ask questions, unless you're unless you're sure that the the question is going to be accepted by the rest of the class, that you're asking something that's appropriate, that's not going to offend, right? And and part of the process of being, you know, a sophomore, one of the you know, one of the smart idiots, right, is that you like you don't know what you don't know, you don't know what you're in the process of learning, and so you have to ask a lot of stupid questions. Yeah. Part of asking the stupid questions are stupid, stupid questions that might be offensive to somebody with certain kinds of sensibilities, but but here we have these classrooms which are spaces in which you can do it, and so like to to, to, to open that up. I mean, this is part of the I think think that like the great liberating effect of liberal education, um, and 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 I think that is being threatened by people on the right and the left right now um there's a you know our our students are so both respectful and cautious i've never seen a generation that's so cautious yes, yes. Uh, before and, and and i'm not sure caution works well with with the university education no, I think it's I, a risky activity it, it is a risky activity and and but that's uh, you know it's hard to get across the idea uh, as we're, well, at least when I was growing up, we were always told there's no such thing as a dumb question because. And, That's and, not true, by the way, but it's like we, we I know it, it was always said, but. Yeah, and, but but there there is a certain truth to that. I mean, that, yeah. it, that, that there, there is importance to ask questions out of ignorance yeah. um, and, and, and to recognize that being dumb and being ignorant are two different things. And because uh, I think that, you know, when I reflect back and I think hearing students and or p teachers in particular saying, oh, my gosh, these students don't know anything. Well, I remember when I started college, I did not know anything. I mean, if it wasn't for some people that I knew were a hundred miles ahead of where I would be, but somehow I knew they had something to say. I still remember Hans Morgenthau was on campus at, at UWL. And he was, I mean, an internationally recognized foreign policy expert. And, and I probably didn't understand a quarter of what he said, but boy, did it open my mind. I mean, you think, no. oh, how how can well just uh, just a fascinating you know when you realize that there's so much that you don't know. Uh, By the way, you know that you touched on something. There's there's a kind of been a shift in uh, in K twelve education and the idea of how we teach reading that yeah. that leveling is probably a bad idea. You know, that was for a long time, all the books were, were leveled. There's a vocabulary appropriate for, 
for each age, you know, and those are the only things that, you know, in fifth grade, you get fifth grade, the, that level, you know, in sixth grade, you get the next. And um, it's not how people learn. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it turns out to be really important to develop a love of reading to be able to le read things that are kind of at your appropriate level, but then things that are above your comprehension because they really stretch you and they kind of, they, your brain responds differently to that kind of stimulus than reading things that you already mastered, but then also to read things that are below your level oh, because yeah. it's easy. It becomes kind of entertainment, but it's also reinforcing. Um, and, um, and it provides a kind of practice that doesn't require a lot of psychic energy to engage in, right? Yes. Um, well, the same thing with, you know, University of Education, like you, um, this is what I hate about assessment culture. <laughs> I hate assessment. And it's always, you know, like everything is scaffolded and so forth. That's not how people learn. No, no. That's not, and you know, you're never going to learn that way when you get out into the world and you have to learn how to do a job, you know, you just get tossed into something and you, you know, you're confused. So what you you get much better at asking questions, at doing exploration when you are exposed to a variety of things. Much of it you don't quite understand, yeah. right? And is clearly beyond you, right? That Those are really invigorating environments to be in. Part of the um, past uh, being a, a window worker at McDonald's, I don't think I've ever had a job that I was qualified for. I always had jobs that I thought, what am I doing here? <laughs> and they were just very, very valuable learning experiences. It was, I mean, everything from selling advertisements for a local shopper, uh, which was a real stretch for me to try to be a business entrepreneur and try to figure out that I had to be self-motivating and all kinds of other things to teaching a university class. You know, it was like, wow. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, this is interesting because this is the, actually, these are the kinds of ethical issues that I think we need to continue to explore in terms of teaching, because um, I think teaching is such a learning profession that, it, and yeah, well, I got a lot of, but well, anyway, one of the interesting, I'm, I'm, I'm shifting back and forth here, but uh, uh, Bob Sternberger, um, Sternberg, who was a theory of education guy, um, wrote a very interesting book, uh, a small, short article, which was called In Praise of Dilettantes. Um, and he basically said one of the problems with universities is they don't hire enough dilettantes. They only hire experts. And then they end up in expert silos and they don't explore things. And again, that's another one of those, I think, ethical issues about teaching and hiring and pulling people out and engaging them in a conversation. And, and so well, one of the things I think happened to the detriment of s small colleges and universities was email. Yeah. Uh, because um, what happened... At one point, you had large research universities that had big departments. And then within those departments, you could have experts in the departments. And they're teaching mainly graduate students and maybe a few undergrads. Uh, but they're they're participating in regular conversation with other people kind of at that expert level. Now, a lot of this has been done by mail and through you know the writing of journal articles and then sharing articles with one another. But you also had many of them that were located on the east and the west coast that were close enough that they could have seminars where the scholars in those departments would move about and visit one another. And then you have those high level expert kind of discussions. But at smaller universities and colleges, especially like ours, like in the Midwest, we're separated. Um, we're, we have small departments. It forces you to be interdisciplinary. And that, so you're not only teaching, you're teaching undergrads, but you're not teaching courses just in the area of your research. You might be doing a little bit of research, but you're, but you're in daily conversation with scholars from a number of other fields. And so then you're more invested in a kind of holistic education. 
And then that's what these kinds of colleges and universities specialized in, is that kind of education in which um, the faculty were all in conversation with one another about the kind of shared educational experience they were providing for their students over the course of four years. As soon as email comes along, now it's possible to be in daily conversation with experts in my own field. So now instead of going to the cafeteria mm -hmm. or across the street, you know, to have lunch and so forth and having with faculty members from other departments, I'm eating lunch while I'm on my computer on, on email. And it was remarkable. I watched how quickly that happened. So, and, and, and then suddenly you had, you had, you had, you had people that were senior members of departments who were still in the habit of forming these relationships with on the campus, but you were hiring younger people who were coming right out of graduate school, continuing to have conversations on a daily basis with the people they went to grad school with, who were at other universities, right? Mm -hmm. And they weren't developing the relationships on their own campus. And in the course of about 10 to 20 years, the whole focus of these small colleges shifted from being really focused on education of their undergraduates to being um, uh, launching pads for individual scholarship. Yes, yes, yes. Well, then, then, then you aren't focused on teaching anymore, right? Then we are mini research universities, and that's kind of what we become. Yeah. And I regret that very much. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and it's interesting, too, I think what I've seen happen with online courses, it's the extension of the same thing. And what I've been trying to do because um, is to ask the question, where are the hallway conversations if you teach online and because that's where things happen you meet somebody on the way to the cafeteria or on the way to the bathroom or just walking down the hall to get to the stairway that's where you have these interactions that are are, are very very fruitful and and very educational and with online classes and students don't have a chance to drop into your office. I mean, I'm yeah. trying to figure out a way to do this with a graduate course that I've been involved in. And that's just to sort of open up the microphone to the class on online like this before and after class. So people can talk to each other and also talk to me so that we can have actual conversations and it's 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 technology is such a mixed blessing uh and especially this and you know i sort of feel guilty in some ways about doing this kind of conversation online but i guess my hope is that this will get some people who have been interviewed to talk to other people who have been interviewed that they didn't know and might have a chance to um, and communicate with them through whatever means they can. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can try to close Pandora's box, but it doesn't do any good. Everything's already out, yeah. right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so then, um, so just like, just not engaging with it, I think doesn't do anybody any good. So then you say, well, okay, here it is. Let's find out how to use it for some for some good purpose. And I think one really good purpose is to refocus conversations on kind of what's what's the point of education. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think if it's if it's not somehow to provide us with a more meaningful life, um, then then we've lost our way. Yes. yes. And um, I and and because I, I don't think the whole point of education can just be like uh, increase the GDP. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, and that's part of the reason why I talked about this in terms of conversation with educators and philosophers, because I think that between the two of them, in my mind, you have all of what education is about. Huh? 
uh, how we engage with students and what the meaning of life is, I suppose. That's the that's kind of the way I see the talking smart uh, being uh, yeah, connected. Yeah. Well, I so suppose let's call this a summary because we have about a half hour. And I thank you very much, Rick. And I'm going to turn off the computer and see if we've done all this. I mean, I'll, the the recording. <laughs>